Good morning. Thus far in this chapel series, we had a, a blessing to hear from three different members of our community offering messages that compels us to think about why is it that we as individual Christians and we as a corporate Christian community must engage with these challenging issues around the racial reconciliation. President Dockery, through his personal testimony, and then Dr. Dana Harris offering us theological and biblical foundation for racial reconciliation. And then last week, Dr. Doug Sweeney offering us a historical account of this very troubled history of race relations in our church within the United States. And the task that was given to me is now to bring our focus back to our campus, to our community. To consider the question, using the commitment paper that you have before you, what do these commitments exactly mean for us, particularly as a Christian learning community? And how might living out these commitments form us individually and corporately? Now, as uh, Dr. Harris mentioned last time, this particular one-page paper comes at the very end of five-page long biblical rationale for racial reconciliation. And this commitment paper, in particular, uh, is now a living document for our community because I don't know if you knew this, because from now on, and this is a board's mandate, every full-time faculty and staff member who sign our contract each year, we need to review our statement of faith and be able to affirm it, our school's positional paper on human sexuality, and now this third document. Now, as a living document, it looks nice on a catalog or, or website, but if we don't practice it, it would not mean much in terms of how it might impact us. So today's message would be about, okay, here are these three commitments. What might it look like for us to practice it together as God's people? So please turn to the document with me. And what I'd like to do is go through these three doc, uh, commitments, and then I would like to end my uh, presentation by briefly reflecting on Psalm 133 that was read. So I'd like to read the introductory paragraph. In light of the supremacy and authority of Scripture and the theological foundations and principles that flow from it, which was explained two weeks ago by Dr. Dana Harris, and in view of TIU's community focus and cultural engagement values and TIU's mission statement, TIU, as a Christian learning community, makes the following three institutional commitments to live as a reconciled community informed by the following givens under the guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The following commitments are intended to be consistent with Scripture and interpreted in accordance therewith, providing guidance for TIU as a learning community. The following commitments focus on relationships and racial reconciliation, recognizing that our human tendency to discriminate against those unlike us, whether with respect to race or in other areas, is a universal product of sin nature. Given the relational nature of our loving and just triune God, who is a unity in diversity, given our dignity and value as creatures made in the image of our God, given the alienating brokenness of the world, and given the reconciling work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the peacemaking task to which we are called. And then we have these three commitments. But in my presentation, I want to work with the third commitment first and work way back up to racial reconciliation. So the third commitment at the bottom of the page I would like to read. TIU commits to the practice of affirming Christ-centered unity in diversity. As our church and society become more diverse and globalized, TIU commits to provide education through which our students will learn how to lead and serve in rich intercultural and international contexts. TIU strives to become a Christ-centered learning community that is 
racially and ethnically diverse and hospitable, providing opportunities for students to learn from and with those who come from different backgrounds, providing potentially transformational experiences that assist students to become more effective kingdom citizens and leaders. In doing so, TIU will avoid any approach that minimizes the richness of diversity by denying the God-affirmed recognition of diverse peoples, Revelation 7-9, and assimilationist approaches that unnecessarily favor a dominant group's cultural values and practices or fail to appropriately affirm and incorporate the cultural values and practices of others to the extent consistent with Scripture. Now, there have been many scholars who have been studying various learning institutions, particularly higher learning institutions, whether secular or Christian, that are trying to make most of the diversity within their learning community. And in doing so, they identified several different models or approaches that the schools take in terms of trying to learn and facilitate diversity. If I could have a first model up, please. One of those models is often called the assimilationist model. And in this model, what you have very clearly is a dominant culture, a majority culture. And then, perhaps because of its location or because it is doing something wonderful, that it's beginning to attract growing number of students from that non-majority backgrounds. Now, having said that, the goal of this particular model is to assimilate those who come from different cultural backgrounds into its own dominant cultural assumptions, values, and practices, whether it's done explicitly or implicitly. So while there might be presence of others who are coming from other cultural locations, there is a very uh, noticeable marginalization of these other cultural groups. It's as if there's a two category of people groups in this learning community. Those who are functioning as hosts, and then there are those who are clearly guests in the periphery. So then the, those who belong to these periphery groups have a choice since many of them know that they will be returning back to their context, they keep that social cultural distance from that institutional culture, or they would choose to assimilate. Either way, because of those situations, that rich intercultural learning that can happen on such a campus often is not experienced and realized. This is the assimilationist model. Then let's go to the second model that often the educators highlighted, and this is called the integrationist model. Now notice how this is very distinctively different from the earlier model that, that you saw. In this model, there is not a clear majority dominant group. Though numerically certain groups might be larger than the other, there is a very intentional effort to live out, if you will, unity in diversity. There is a more intentional effort among different cultural groups to learn from one another and learn with one another. The other noticeable thing about this model is that what's at the center? It's not the dominant majority group, culture that is pulling everybody in, but what's at the center is this compelling core that consists of a certain vision or certain convictions, or certain values or certain beliefs that is so great that all these groups are willing to live by or submit to that unifying factor. A compelling core that pulls every group 
together. And in this context, there is a more intentional learning, intercultural learning that takes place. And then finally, in many ways, this is a practicing of that model that we often hear unity in diversity. There is a clearly a unifying factor, but there is also clear recognition and valuing of differences that different groups bring. Now, if you go back to our commitment, the third commitment paragraph, and reread that clearly, it is very clear why our committee, when we were working through the biblical and theological foundation, as well as this particular commitment, which of those two models we were moving towards. And we believe that this is the model that we should strive after fundamentally because the scriptures and its understanding of the rich theme of unity and diversity points us to this model. But then secondly, in our conversations, we also acknowledged that TEDS and TGS as a learning institution, in terms of how we approach theological education, we have been practicing this integrationist model in how we teach our theology. Unity in diversity. It was 1983 when I first showed up on this campus as an MDiv student. Now what's interesting is that I knew no one who went to TEDS. My father, who had been a minister for 40 years, he never heard of TEDS. And in fact, all the Korean church people I knew, none of them went to TEDS. So then why did I come here? Since I have absolutely no connection to TEDS. In fact, admissions officer, when I applied, said that you might be our second or third Korean student who applied to this school. You know what it was? It was this. I wanted to go for my seminary training to a place where there would be a strong, compelling center that unifies God's people. Our submission to the authority of scriptures, our strong commitment to inerrancy of scriptures, our submission to the lordship of Christ, our taking seriously God's greatest commission for us to reach all people with the gospel of Jesus. Those very things that we would not compromise. But then what was equally important for me was that I would have an opportunity to sit under the teachings from, yes, yeah, someone who, from, who is from Reformed theology background as I was, but I also wanted to have an opportunity to sit under faculty members who come from Wesleyan and Lutheran and Anglican backgrounds. And that I would have an opportunity to interact with classmates who come from these other branches of evangelicalism. So that I would know not just what to think, but perhaps more importantly, how to think theologically about these various issues. My guess is that many of you who are here as a students or as a faculty, you have, to, you have chosen to be part of this learning community because you are drawn to that model of theological education. That's our DNA. Now, our committee's challenge for us is now grow based upon this particular DNA of our school, our way of practicing unity and diversity in our theological reflections. Now bring another layer of learning to this, and that is our intercultural learning. As God is sending more and more students and faculty and staff from various different backgrounds, how do we practice this now at the intercultural dimension? I shared with you, it was 1983 when I first showed up on this uh, campus, and I went to my first advisee group meeting. Back then, it was not called formation group, but it was called advisee group meeting, and I went to one. And what 
it was the first day of introduction, so we're going around and introducing ourselves. And what struck me was that many of my student members in that advising group, their last name ended with either S-O-N or S-E-N. <laughs> so there were a lot of Johnsons, Swansons, Olsons. And it was, when it was my time to introduce myself, I said, you can call me Peter Chasson. <laughs> now, since 1983, we've come a long way. The latest statistical figure shows that Ted's TGS Deerfield campus, 30 to 35 percent of our students are non-white students, whether they are from North America or around the global world. You know, sociologists define an organization as a multi-ethnic when at least 20% of the members of that community come from non-majority background. So using that definition, Ted's TGS community is clearly now beyond that multi-ethnic definition boundary. We are multi-ethnic learning community. However, you know, a community can be multi-ethnic demographically, but still be very monocultural. And that's a default. If we do nothing, that's what would happen. That would be back to the assimilationist model. But if as a learning community, as faculty members, as students, as, as a formation group leaders, If we were to intentionally steward the rich kingdom gifts that God has brought to our campus from so many different backgrounds, what might it look like for our classroom interaction, our chapel service, our formation group time, when we intentionally envision that our future direction is with this integrationist model? Christ-centered unity in diversity. We believe that is God's not only unique DNA gift to TEDS and TGS, but it is also a journey that God is calling us to continually grow into. Second commitment. Again, when you're a commitment document, let's go to the second commitment. And it reads like this. TIU commits to the biblical practice of justice. A biblical understanding of reconciliation includes justice. This is especially critical to racial reconciliation since racism and racial inequality continue to undermine the goal of racial healing and unity. TIU, as a Christian university, strives to grow in its journey of racial reconciliation and justice by practicing the biblical value of mutuality. That is to say, TIU seeks to foster true equality among all its members who come from different ethnic, gender, and racial backgrounds, such that image bearers relate to other image bearers with genuine honor, fairness, and respect. Rather than engage in the politics of identity that seeks to advance the interests of one's own people group, as a Christian community, we aim to serve the interests of others as Christ model for us, Philippians 2, 1 through 5. As a Christian university, TIU commits to empower all members of its community to fully exercise their gifts, working towards eliminating forms of racial prejudice and systemic racism that can undermine this goal of peacemaking or shalom bringing. Now, earlier I mentioned that in many secular universities, while they're striving to work toward this integrationist model, one of the toughest challenges they often encounter is, what should occupy that compelling center? You know, how can we name that center? Because remember, this is not a spiritual community. Uh, how do they come up with that? what the center ought to be that would inspire different people groups to come together in unity. Fairly early on, 
many of the scholars identify that should be social justice. And, you know, that's why all the multicultural literatures out there, social justice functions as if it were the gospel. The challenge, though, practically has been this. Who gets to define what social justice means and what it looks like? Because different people groups had different vision of it. And so instead of it being a unifying factor, it often became a divisive factor. So while this model looks good on a paper, it rarely gets to be achieved. However, for Christian organizations, especially evangelical learning community like ours, this is something that we should strive after. But for us, the center is the gospel, is the lordship of Christ, and his mandate for us to be his witness to the ends of the earth. Those are our center. But we would argue that justice cannot be left out from that center as well. First of all, because that's what Scripture mandates God's people to do, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. But then, how do we define what this justice should be? Well, just importing secular concept of social justice would be very problematic. So we need to now carefully, biblically, define what this justice might be and what it looks like. And one of the things that we as a committee focused on was a biblical theme of mutuality. And this is one of the reasons why. You know, on a secular campus, for instance, when I was a doctoral student at Northwestern, there was a sense of expectation that if you are an Asian American professor, you need to strongly advocate for the cause and the interests of Asian American students on this campus. If you're a Latino faculty member, of course you should do that. If you're a gay lesbian faculty member, yes, you should fight for the cause, the interests of gay lesbian students on campus. And that led to what's on, called on this paper, identity politicking. So as a committee, we used completely countercultural language that is biblical. Instead of using justice to seek what interests need to be protected of my people, we need to be Christ-like as in Philippians chapter 2 and continually think about the interests of others, and particularly of those people groups who are marginalized and minoritized in our community. Looking for the interests of others. Mutual empowerment, mutuality. But how do we grow in that practice? Some of you may have read this book, Miroslav Volf, uh, I think it was in mid-1990s, wrote a powerful book called Exclusion and Embrace when it first came out, became the book of the year for Christianity today. And in that book, he makes this argument that when you and I become a new believer, a new creation in Christ, and when the Holy Spirit come dwell within us, that Holy Spirit empowers us to have a new relationship with God above so that we become more and more sanctified and become like him. And then he argues that same Holy Spirit also empowers us so that we can redefine our horizontal relationship and that we would learn how to embrace others, particularly those with whom I have had historical animosity and conflict that they become part of who I am. And in that context, he, he made this argument that when the Holy Spirit empowers us, we are able to embrace others, and that embracing of others take two distinctive steps. One is to open your arm like this. I mean, after all, this is what's required when you are going to embrace the other person. But then this opening of arm gestures one's humility that says, I by myself am not complete, or we as our people group by ourselves are not complete, 
because you are so different than I am, I need you in my life. That's a humility. But then secondly, it's also a gesture that communicates vulnerability. And this is not a self-protecting posture. You could get hurt. And then he says the second rhythm of embracing others is to bring your arms around that person lovingly. And it's at that point he makes this uh, remark, and that is, but human fallenness being what it is, often we are tempted to give the other person what he called oppressive bear hug of assimilation. Unless you become just like me, I cannot have you in my life. Unless you worship the way I worship, unless you watch the same TV program that I do, unless you root for the same sports team that I do, unless you vote for the same candidates that I do. But then as we learn to embrace others who are so different than I am, not only you and I gain the gifts that we never had, but also new pain. Because now as we learn to embrace others, their pain becomes my pain. What frustrates them becomes source of my frustration. What keeps them up at night becomes the source of concern and worry for myself. And when we, as a community, and as individual Christians, learn to embrace more and more of others into my life than their concerns, the forms of injustice and prejudice that afflicts my brothers and sisters that I may not personally have experienced, they become my personal afflictions. And so as a community, we learn to address the various forms of injustice and prejudices and discrimination that exists in all human institutions, including our own, that we are able to work on it together, which is decisively different model than identity politicking that is trying to work out the justice in a very divisive fashion. Now, let me go to the third one. I don't know if I would ever get to Psalm 133, but <laughs> third commitment. TIU commits to the biblical practices consistent with peacemaking and racial reconciliation. God calls his people to love their neighbors, to be agents of reconciliation in today's world of racial conflict and violence. Many TIU students come from racially homogeneous communities and congregations with limited opportunities to interact with Christians from other ethnic and racial backgrounds. TIU, as a racially diverse Christian learning community, thus has a unique opportunity to express the kingdom experience of reconciliation for its students, staff, and faculty. As a university, therefore, we commit to the task of A, continually developing and teaching a robust biblical theology of racial reconciliation, B, intentionally creating spaces in and out of classrooms where members can develop deeply meaningful and transformative relationships across racial and ethnic boundaries. C, regularly modeling the Christian practice of hospitality, repentance, and forgiveness. And D, producing Christian leaders who are able to collaborate effectively with others in the ministry of reconciliation in today's Divisive world, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. You know, when the secular universities try to bring their best resources to do multicultural education and what they call diversity management, their loftiest goal that they're shooting for is tolerance. How do we teach our students and faculty to tolerate those who are different than they are? Well, notice... What Scripture mandates us is not merely tolerating one another, but it's a reconciliation. And there's a huge difference between those two 
pictures. Now, reconciliation is possible for Christians because of the work Christ has done on the cross, Ephesians chapter 2. He not only reconciled with God above, but he broke down the walls that separated Jews and Gentiles so that horizontal reconciliation is also achieved. You and I are not to think that reconciliation is something that we pursue, that we achieve. No, it's a God's work, God's gift to us. And his mandate for us is to steward it. And also, as Miroslav Volf argues, that reconciliation horizontally is possible because of the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. So let's not think as a Christian community, reconciliation is our work. It's a God's work already accomplished and done. It's a spirit-powered enterprise. And yet, we are not to be passive agents because reconciliation also requires us to do that work of journey of hard work, and it would cost us. Because you see, whenever there is a conflict and needs to be reconciliation, there needs to be cycles of forgiveness and repentance and so forth. My family and I attend a multiracial congregation in the city of Chicago, pastored by our Trinity alum. And about a year ago, because we were going through such a turbulent time in the city of Chicago with race relations, he preached for a whole month from the scriptures, very faithfully but prophetically, about sin of racism and what God calls us to do in terms of racial reconciliation. After that preaching series were done, a number of Anglo members of the church approached this pastor who's non-white and asked if there might be a time in the next worship service where a number of our Anglo brothers and sisters, in light of what they heard from the preaching, wanted to have a public time of prayer of repentance. So the pastor calls me up and says, how do we do this? I never learned this in a worship liturgy class. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we don't know how many people would exactly participate in this. So why don't we, after the worship is formally done, invite people to stay if they choose to, and just allow these Anglo brothers and sisters to have a public prayer of repentance. So that very next Sunday, that's what happened. Now, I was not sure how many people actually take up that opportunity to go up to the front of the church and publicly pray in prayer of a repentance of racism, sin of racism. And the other one is how many church members would actually stay? You know, many times after church service, they all have lunch appointments and they just disappear. But that day, most of the congregation members stayed. And then one by one, these Anglo brothers and sisters would come up. And they would face the cross at the front of the altar. So their back would be toward us. Into the microphone, they would be offering this really hard, felt prayer of repentance as a person who comes from dominant culture, white privilege, white power, some of the things that they were not even aware of before and how they have committed sin of omission as well as commission. Many prayed the prayer of a personal repentance. Some repented for the family that they grew up in. Some repented for the state of the city of Chicago and of our nation. It went on for a whole hour. And then at the very end, an older African-American gentleman who is a member of our church came up, and he also repented his sin of hatred toward white people in general. And then he ended with this powerful prayer of thanksgiving in which he said, most black believers in this country would not have an opportunity to hear single prayer like this offered by an Anglo brother in their lifetime. But how blessed he felt to be in a prayer session where he heard whole hour long prayer repentance being offered by our Anglo brothers and sisters in the church. 
it was one of those transformative, God-breaking-through kind of moment for that congregation and for us as individuals. You know how Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about grace is not cheap because it co costed our Lord everything. But then often we as a recipients of that grace, we cheapen it. And so we have this thing called cheap grace that continually undermines our discipleship process. I also believe unless we're careful, there is such thing as a cheap reconciliation. It costed our Savior everything to accomplish that reconciliation for us on the cross. But because today reconciliation is such a popular saying, right? Yeah, I'm all for racial reconciliation. But we need to make sure that what we embrace and practice is not a cheap reconciliation but that one that would cost us something individually, corporately, and therefore one that would transform us in the journey. Brothers and sisters, those who have been engaged in the ministry of reconciliation for a long time, they often say racial reconciliation is not a program, it's not an event, and it's not even firefighting the crisis management. Racial reconciliation is a journey. A journey. And now that we have adopted this document, as now we have these three commitments before us, it is my prayer that we as Christ-centered learning community, that we would think racial reconciliation as not just as an extracurricular activity few activists might do, but it is directly tied to the second greatest commandment that the Lord has given us, loving our neighbors as we would love ourselves. And therefore, it must really be part of our discipleship formation journey. I think that would honor the Lord, and that would enrich all of us. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, Lord, as we think about, continually think about this topic of racial reconciliation, we're reminded that ultimately this is your divine work. It is your son's sacrificial death on the cross and your gift of the Holy Spirit that enable us to even engage in this ministry of racial reconciliation. Lord, we pray that as we continue in this journey as a learning community, that you would grant us wisdom from above, and also you would grant us the necessary strength to not give up when things get tough, but continue on this journey that we may more and more become the beloved community that is reconciled in and through you, O oh God. We pray that as we continue on this journey, our students, particularly who go through our learning experience at TEDS, as they go into the ministry of the gospel in today's broken, broken world, racially divided, conflicted settings, that many would know how to continue their journey in those settings and that the ministry they would lead would bring not only new people into your kingdom who would reconcile with you, O oh God, but they would also be those who would be reconciling with others around them. And we pray all this in the most precious name of our Lord Jesus.